Hello. Welcome. Hello and great greetings. Hey, everybody. Hello. Howdy. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello there. Hello. At Orlando Fringe, we believe in amplifying voices. Our goal is to ensure that we are creating and fostering an inclusive, equitable, and collaborative environment. One that promotes participation and openly recruits diverse performances and stories. Providing opportunities for underrepresented artists and communities. By not only offering a platform for inclusive shows, artwork, and experiences, but by facilitating and creating opportunities for coaching, mentorship, and scholarships. And by offering any guidance that might help on their artistic journey. Ultimately, our greatest ambition is that artists and patrons of any background will see themselves represented in the work showcased at the Orlando Fringe Festival, as well as all of our year-round events, and that we might serve as a model and inspiration to other artists and all arts organizations in our own community and around the world. Come check us out. So join us. Join us. So join us. Welcome to Orlando Fringe. 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 You're all welcome. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our forum, Conversations with Community. Alex Morazic, I am one of the members here of the Orlando Fringe IDA community, and I would like to welcome you to our inaugural stream of our series, Conversations with the Community. Uh, tonight, we want to invite you to a safe place, a place for everyone to learn, to grow, to question, and collaborate so we can create not only a more equal and diversified arts community, but a more unified community as a whole. Staff, patrons, and artists of Orlando Fringe have been meeting since June of last year as an answer to the call of the Black Lives Matter movement and our fellow BIPOC artists to begin the process of creating more equity in our central Florida arts community. We brought into discussion the need for better representations of our LGBTQA plus community, specifically with the transgender and gender non-conforming artists. We also look to our disabled community and the accessibility issues that need to be addressed. And as I said, this is just the beginning of a process. There's no simple answer, a fix all switch that will make everything better automatically. It is a journey to better ourselves and the general public so there is a seat at the table for all no matter your race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexuality, economic status, or abilities. We recognize that we don't know everything. The mistakes will be made. However, we are willing to make and learn from those mistakes. We know that it is all right to seek for answers and we find new information. We'll be open to accept it and not dismiss it just because it doesn't fit our worldview. We invite you to join us on this journey and grow with us. We've invited some members of the community that are doing incredible work to help bring our better equality to the art world and the world in general. I would like now to introduce you our esteemed panel for this evening. We have Mika King. She's a worship leader, actor, author from Central Florida. She's toured the globe, sharing her gift and ministry in six continents. She's appeared in acclaimed productions for Cirque du Soleil, Walt Disney World, Universal Studios, and been featured in Essence Magazine. She's an advocate for equity and diversity in the arts entertainment and was a 2020 nominee for Actors Equity Foundation's Paul Robertson Award for outstanding humanitarian efforts in the industry. Mika, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd also like to introduce, introduce Makai Eastman. He's a director, playwright, based in Tampa, Florida, and is a member of the Orlando Fringe Ida community. Committee, part. A graduate of the University of Tampa, he intends to combine his passion for the arts and public service to produce works that progresses society. His previous directing credits include Angels in America, Part One, Shakespeare's R and J, Dutchman, and Tick Tick Boom. Next, I would like to introduce Felipe Souza Lazabelle. He is the Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity Senior Specialist for the Office of Multicultural Affairs at the City of Orlando. In his capacity, he proposes policy recommendations, programs, advocates for best practices on LGBTQ issues, immigrant and refugee affairs, as well as outreach in the Muslim, Brazilian, Arab American communities 
to encourage greater participation in city services. He co-directed Get Equal, a national social justice LGBTQ organization, and he has served as the deputy managing director at United We Dream, the largest immigrant youth network in the country. Next, we have Heather Wilkie. She has dedicated 17 years of community service and leadership in the nonprofit sector. For over four years, she has served as the executive director for Zebra Coalition, an organization whose mission is to support and inspire LGBTQ plus youth. Prior to her work at Zebra Coalition, Ms. Wilkie served as Chief Operating Officer for Harbor House of Central Florida, where she was responsible for the development and monitoring of programs for one of the largest and most comprehensive domestic abuse organizations in the United States. Next, we have Stacia Boyd. She's a co-founder, president, and the creative driving force behind Q Media, an award-winning mobile tour production company that provides arts, cultural, historic institutions with interpretive, accessibility, and multi-language experiences for their visitors. Q Media's accessibility projects include such diverse sites as the Klondike Gold Rush Museum, Wright Brothers National Memorial, Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, Walt Disney Family Museum, the Bell Museum of Natural History, Holocaust Museum Houston, and Edge Experience at Hudson Yards. Finally, we have Megan Bouye. She's the Regional Program Coordinator for Arts for All. The mission of Arts for All is to provide, support, and champion arts education and cultural experiences for and by people with disabilities. Their vision is to create a world in which the arts are universally acceptable and accessible. I also want to welcome our lovely co-host. You might know her as Tush, but you also know her as Tamisha Harris. She's gonna be taking questions from all of you lovely people as you type in. There she is, Miss America, looking lovely. <laughs> so thank you, first of all, to this wonderful panel. Uh, I'm so excited to be starting this. Um, let's get into this. We have questions. Uh, we talked about it earlier. We have questions for all these specific groups in these communities, but we also have questions that we feel fit uh, a broad range. It kind of hits everyone. Uh, so I want to start with one of our LGBTQ questions for um, Felipe and for Heather. What do you feel are the specific ways that the theater and the arts and including visual, visual arts as well, can provide that for the youth of the LGBTQ that can offer them a platform and an opportunity for storytelling. What are, what are the ways of the community that, that they can open up and provide those platforms? All right, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I think that representation matters no matter what we're talking about. And, you know, I, I believe that lifting voices is very important, making sure that um, that we're being considerate and mindful when we're doing casting, making sure that we have um, a lot of different types of voices at the table. LGBTQ is a lot of acronym, right? Uh, there's a lot of diversity within the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, we talk a lot about intersectionality. We're not just one culture, or one person. And so making sure that you have representation of each of those um, areas is very important. And also for young people, I think just asking them is a big deal, right? If we don't know, ask. Um, it may be um, if it's possible to have a youth council, a youth advisory council, or have some leaders within the organization where you can um, ask them what it is that they feel like is underrepresented. Um, and then also visibility is very important, making sure that in your marketing, making sure that in where, you know, when we're doing plays and that we're doing performances that we're showing the characters um, that are representative of the community. So that's just some ideas that I think there, there's a lot of great things that, that we can do to make sure that we're inclusive. I like that. Like, I, 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 and I think that's a great thing for, for all of our groups here and for anybody is like, if you, if you don't know, if you don't understand, ask. Somebody will have the answer for you, and they—they they, that's the thing. You just have to take that first step to ask. Uh, Felipe, no, I absolutely agree with everything that Heather said. I would only add uh, that not only representation representation is important, but decision making power is critical. So sometimes uh, we include people with many voices, but we're not completely open to hearing them or changing the ways that we that we operate. Uh, and that's part of a listening session, but really asking people to speak also implies that we're willing to change and that their voice actually matters. So we have to give them some decision-making power. 
And also, you know, I've been reflecting a lot about the power of coming out, which is really the power of storytelling. It's still the most uh, significant and perhaps one of the oldest of all LGBTQ adv advocacy tools. We come out and, you know, sometimes we pay a very high price when we come out. We lose our family, we lose our jobs, uh, we lose our networks, uh, depending of our religious affiliation, we can lose our churches and etc. right? We can lose a lot. But every time we come out, uh, we really open people's hearts and minds. And I have heard time and time again that that has been a really important tool for people. Uh, so really giving an opportunity for people to tell their own personal stories from their own personal perspective. And our stories are so complex that our intersectionalities would just emerge. Uh, and, uh, and I really believe that the arts have that really strong, powerful moment and it can change culture uh, in a way that other sectors of society can't. I agree with that. I think when you look back in history and in time, you find uh, after times of, of hardship, the, the arts, those those are the groups of people, the writers, the creators, the sculptors, the painters, they're the ones that kind of lead the way and, sh and show what could be the next step. And I kind of want to segue to um, uh, Makai and Mika um, about the, to the same kind of question. What are the things, especially for the youth, that we can do for our BIPOC community, that we can do the same thing? What are the ways that we can reach out to them and support them and provide the same platforms? Well, I think the most important thing is, and at least if we're, talk, if we're talking about equity, I think the most important thing would be to allow BIPOC individuals to have the same opportunities as much as the white counterparts may be able to. And specifically talking about in the Orlando theater scene, you know, it's a very expensive endeavor to be able to take out such a huge chunk of time uh, that you could be devoting to either work or caring at home or what have you, and then attend certain rehearsals that either pay you very little or don't pay you at all in most cases. Um, with that being said, that it, it's a, it puts you in a demoralizing situation to think, well, you know, I can't even, uh, I don't mind volunteering my time, but the reality is I cannot afford to volunteer my time. Or even if, sure, I might be able to audition for something or work on something that actually could pay me. However, because of the the very obstructive vision of type, what have you, comes into play and then, well, because I'm not blonde hair, blue eyed, the stereotypical tenor or uh, ingenue, and then I, I lose that opportunity just because that's not how I was, that's not how I came out the moon. So definitely making sure that we have those same steps to get to where we will be able to express our art in the best way that we possibly can. Mika? We know we love technology. Yes, so I realized <laughs> that I needed to unmute myself. <laughs> um, so I uh, I totally agree with everything Makai just said, and I um, want to add that if we're talking about youth specifically, one of the things that we really need to focus on is accessibility. And that means giving them access to a lot of the things that um, people from underserved communities don't um, really get the opportunity to have access to. So that means classes, um, acting, singing, dancing, uh, directing, producing classes, um, apprenticeships, um, internships, mentorships, uh, those types of things that will help raise them up. And also we, um, we know that a lot of what happens in our industry is based on proximity. So they don't have access to these spaces because they've not been raised up in these spaces. So um, if we give them, you know, the access to the classes and to um, the things that they need to be raised up, then they will be, you know, kind of in, in the circles and in, in, in the rooms. Um, but we also need to make sure that um, that once they're given these opportunities, that they're on the radar of the people who are making decisions. Um, and I think, you know, like I said, by proximity, that that is just a byproduct of it. It it, it will yeah. it will come as a result of that. Um, but I think the main thing is is giving them access and the opportunity to uh, take advantage of the of the same um, 
experiences that will help prepare them for their careers. It is sounding like between what you were saying and what Felipe was saying earlier, it's kind of like this, this timeline of setting the accessibility um, for these, these youth that might be in these different communities, but then also giving them not that, but that pathway all the way to where can we get to to make those decisions, to be the ones helping make those decisions. And it's creating that pathway from, it, it, we're not, what we're kind of discovering is that there's not just like a part missing in the pathway, that whole pathway. A whole really thing. Um, for all those groups. Makai. And real quick, get out on that, Mika, that's a wonderful idea with the classes, but to even go on that, classes are very expensive. And, you know, an economic factor is very much something that needs to be considered because unfortunately not everybody has the privilege to be able to take these $100 per session classes and get these professional headshots that cost upwards of $500 if you want them done right. Yeah, and, and that's why I'm saying it's important for um, them to have access to those things, to, um, you know, be given the, the opportunity to take advantage of those things, even if they, you know, are not financially able to do so. So it's sounding like it's also not, it's like not only creating the programs, but like you said, creating whatever those foundations, the money that might need to be, the scholarships to assist mm -hmm. in those areas that don't have the accessibility, don't have those space, they don't even know those spaces exist. Right. Um, so it really is a true grassroots thing of not just create the program, but we have to figure out how we, can we help people in mm -hmm. get into that program as well? How can we help the youth get into the program and the community in general? Um, and I kind of want to open this up and, and segue up into the um, accessibility here. Oh, do you have something, Tush? No, I was just going to say that we definitely have an uphill battle to climb with that because arts in America aren't necessarily funded as well as other places. So there's a whole another level to that. And, you know, we, we sometimes think, oh, it's just this one level. And like you said, it's a whole bunch of levels that we, that we have to teach the community about what it takes to get there. And when we don't have that, that umbrella support, what we got to do to get it you know, and really help having a, figuring out a way to make the community come together and talk to each other and figure out how to get more money <laughs> from the government is uh, possibly another way that these meeting meetings like this will help us. So continue on, Alex. No, that's fine. And, and like you said, it's, it is a different, it's a, as because for you, you've you've traveled and you've seen kind of the arts in in different co uh, countries, and I know other people have as well. And it's we do every year we we hear about how much the National Endowment of the Arts gets slashed and how less and less money is is put into these programs, and then especially in the schools as well. And that's sometimes that is the only way a child, a youth, might be able to get access to any sort of arts is in the school, and it's just being pulled out and it's being taken out. All these things, so. Um, it is. It's uh, It's trying to build yourself and support yourself at the same time. It, it's. It's very. It, it, we it's, understand. It's, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to open it up. We've been talking about, um, you know, accessibility, and I want to open this up for um, Sasha and Megan. Is we've talked, you know, we've talked about the youth and and issues that we might not know how to get them into the theater. Um, but for the communities, the disabled communities. What do you think are special needs that those communities are facing that we might not even be aware of? Um, I'll, I'll start, or Megan, do you want to start on this one or do you want me to take it? Okay, take it away. Everyone's um, so, I love it. Everyone's so polite. It's very <laughs> nice. We love it. We love civilized discussion. <laughs> well, I think uh, I think one of the most important things to to keep in mind when it comes to the the disability community is first of all, it's an incredibly wide and broad community. Um, there are many different types of abilities and disabilities, and within those are are massive ranges. Uh, so, kind of as for an example, my specialty is uh, with the visually impaired and the blind community, and that's everything from uh, a person who was born blind to a person like my uh, mother-in-law who's 90 years old and has macular degeneration. Those are two very different lived experiences. At the same time, they all fall under that, that banner. There's also low vision versus high vision. Same thing with um, other types of mobility disabilities. There are people who are you know, in wheelchairs with, with uh, 
uh, blow tubes to be able to move that that chair and then there are people who look like they're walking fine but they're not they might have ms maybe there's something else that's happening they might have hand weaknesses or, or etc and so the number one thing i think for uh to serve this community if you're really going to work at it is first of all it is bigger and broader and there is probably no one person who specializes in all of it precisely um for me it's like when i look when i look around and going okay i don't i know more than your average bear about most of it but i know a lot about one portion of it and to kind of take that as an approach when you're sitting down to have this conversation whether it's with your community or whatever to make sure that it's broader than you than you think and the second one that i think is and somebody mentioned this earlier and i forgot who it was but it is that concept of nothing about us without us if you are going to be doing something for any community there needs to be somebody on that community in a decision making, uh, influencing um, uh, capacity. Otherwise, it's like you know, hey, look at this, look at this wonderful thing we made for y'all. We made for y'all, as if there's some uh, that in and of itself. Here, we're trying to give you this thing that you had no input into. So, I would say those are probably my two things, and the main one, honestly, is is range, and the second one is absolutely seat at the table. And I see everyone like nodding their head. Yes, that's the important thing is that that's I think it was Felipe who said that it's the people who are making the decisions. They need to the, that needs to be the wide range as well. Yeah. Megan, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Thank you so much. I love it when people bring up nothing about us without us. That is so important. And of course, the disability community is not monolithic. Um, anyone can become a member at any time, at any age. Um, so we're very welcoming that way. Um, and I would just say in terms of speaking of youth in the arts, um, I would strongly encourage people to remember that um, in terms of representation, um, it's very tempting to have people with disabilities um, play only disabled roles. It is equally important for us to be represented in roles where we are not key. <laughs> um, so just having someone who is in the background and normalizing representation of people with disabilities is just as important. And remembering um, not only in performing arts, but also including people with disabilities as members of your crew, as your techs, um, as on all fronts, and making sure that any of those opportunities that you offer as jobs and as internships include language um, that is inviting. Um, for example, if you don't really need to have this person lift 50 pounds, then please don't include that or put that it's negotiable so that so that anybody can be a part. Um, I see that Sasha wants to add on, so I'm going to defer to her. I, I, that point is is so in, incredibly profound about you know people being in the background. I was just working on a project in in New York um, this past year, and it was for Edge, the um, the new opening at Hudson Yards. We're doing the accessibility con component of that, and they were doing all this incredible marketing, and it was all about you know the accessibility, and we saw all sorts of you know um, varied representation because it's New York, and in all of those pictures. There was not a single person in a wheelchair. There was not a single person holding a cane. There was not a, I mean, it simply wasn't there. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, with the millions and millions of dollars uh, and these very, very, you know, co committed and, and working so hard to be inclusive and you missed this broad swath of humanity. Um, and I mean, again, again they, they were paying for us to be there to do, to do work. But so when you're doing your marketing campaigns, your advertising campaigns, if you're doing some pictures of somebody buying tickets, have somebody just buy some tickets holding a cane or have some person buy, you know, or have them with their child or with their grandparent doing something normal. And I really think that that whole idea of, of normalization, of normalizing people within your community Otherwise, it's like, you know, oh, look at us. Here's my here's my little spotlight that I'm going to shine on. It's almost like I'm, I want that reflected light. It's like, oh, yes, here's a person in a wheelchair. <gasps> look at me for thinking of that. And that's that's a ridiculousness that we sometimes forget about. 
I saw that touch. I was like, yeah, oh, look, I'm patting myself on the back. Look at the good thing I did. Um, and, and what I want to bring up, and I, this is the next second segment I kind of want to go into, is you both talked about normalizing. It's just about normalizing the idea that we know every, everyone's got something. That, you know, There's something different about everyone. And we need to normalize it across the board. And we don't want to do it in a way, or we don't want to do it just for a pat on the back. We don't want to do it to hit the diversity quota. And so my next, where I kind of want to transfer to uh, the next segment to, um, for all of our groups here is how, how do you see is the best way for those communities to be represented so that it doesn't become tokenism, that it doesn't become a quota. Um, I know Megan, you said, you know, it's not just about what is the face of like the public face. You know, we think of actors and we see that, but there are so many other people. There's writers, directors, crew members. Um, so I want to open it up and whoever would like to go first, but how do we step past, uh, you know, how to go into normalizing it, but step past just this tokenizing and-, and, and making You know, sure I think true. Uh, I 100% agree with uh, Stacia and what she just said. We've got to get past trying to put a feature on to just making sure that, um, people from all of these communities are just in the normal crux of the matter. Like, you know, when we talk about theater, you know, or when we talk about TV film or any of that, like, why can't the black family just be on the street with the rest of the families? Why can't the black family be, you know, black people in the grocery store? We do grocery shop as well. So, you know, we can we can be the family in the commercial without it having to be a black commercial for a black, you know, uh, soul food item in the grocery store. It can just be that, you know, we hey, you know, we we buy Coca-Cola, too. Like, hey, we you know, we buy eggs, too. So we have to stop picking it out and making it just we're normal everyday citizens. So I think it's a mentality change uh, that people, the majority, have to stop singling us out and just seeing us as regular people. And I mean, I, I say it so simple and matter of fact because it's simple and matter of fact. Like no, I, yeah. we have to get to a place where people stop, um, you know, centering things that uh you know they think only the majority does or like they only view the majority in in this in these ways so we have to start understanding that we all fit into this together and we're all a part of this together and so i think that's how it becomes normal you know when we when we see it, because right now i'm going to tell you like even though you know we're making such great leaps and bounds with diversity and inclusion it's still very, uh, very noticeable to me. Like it's still very noticeable when I see a black person in a movie. It's still very noticeable when I see a black person on a commercial. It's still very noticeable when I see black people on theater stages, like they stand out. So I wanna get to the point where I don't even think about that because it's so normalized that we're there. Yeah. So, okay, let me, cause you just hit on. <laughs> I, was, I was putting my hand up. <laughs> Only because I have a notebook that I started in, I think I started this one in 2013, where I, it says, <laughs> how I keep track of sisters that look like me on TV. <laughs> and I would mark this and I'd be like, okay, this role can be played by anybody. This could have been a family and this, this, this. And I had all these little ticks in this pretty little notebook that somebody gave me and I'm supposed to keep sweet notes in. And it was put on me so much that I needed to watch television through these this kind of filter or just what was already pushed on me. Like this is this is what society sees. This is okay, 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 okay. Fast forward to now, I still have this conversation with my partner inside and he's like, you just don't see it this way. And I'm like, bro, I'm still seeing it. <laughs> and and so we have this conversation and I've had to break it down. I'm like, we got to get to those people who are doing casting, who are writing and creating and all of those things. But we have to get to those people that are in casting as well to help change some of their minds or open their minds. I don't want to change it. I just need to open it. And if you don't want it open, that's fine. 
but change open some of their minds so that they can help create some of this world that the rest of us see, yeah. you know? And that was kind of a question that I was going to ask. Not even the rest of us see, but the rest of us live. Live. We the rest live. of us live. We live. You're, right. <laughs> You're definitely right on that. I was wondering about, um, do we have representation of artists, you know, um, I know professionally pretty. That's no. Yeah, that's, that's, a, the name that's of, yeah. Yeah, professionally pretty does model scout tattling. You know, do we have a talent agent C agency in the Florida region that represents uh, our 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 artists that have disabilities and our need, you know, special attention? I don't want to say it like that. That was so rude. No, I understand what you mean, but but an agency, and I do want to I I do want to circle back to this. So I want to I do because that is definitely a question we want to talk about it casting specifically because that's a multi layered issue there of things. But I know I saw Makai and Felipe's hand go up, and and I think maybe Heather wanted to say something as well. So, uh, Makai. Yeah, I wanted to also agree with Mika's point and the fact of you know it, it's. I think it's gonna require at the beginning a little bit more of, and I don't wanna use this buzzword to scare people with affirmative action to say, okay, well, how can I at least put as much effort into people in the past have excluded us? How can I do that to include us at the first um, at the first instance of it? Bring us to the table and say, all right, well, we have, uh, we have black people on the board. We have black people in the casting room. We have black people backstage. So, at what point do we keep pushing it to the way to where, as Tamisha said, it's not noticeable to see? Well, I have a whole book of of how people look like me appear on stage or TV, and I think also breaking the mold of well, we can do more things that include black people outside the month of February perhaps. And, you know, there are plenty of black writers that you can ask uh, to see about, okay, well, how can I produce a show by so-and-so, not just August Wilson, but, you know, the wide birth of people. How do I include in my forefront of casting? I don't have to necessarily say, well, all right, if I have a white person playing this person, then in order to make it look right, I have to you know, match their, their persona. Equal. Yeah, exactly. Just make it equal. And even in the backstage applications, you know, if somebody's applying to be stage manager, or whatever, it could help to just at a certain point, take the race question off. Uh, what race do you identify with? That will make it at least more equitable to say, well, okay, I don't want to make sure that they check the box for whatever. And then we can just, put them at the forefront or even in the worst case scenario, put them at the back burner. Felipe? Well, I think what a few points. So one is I really liked what Megan said about how we write uh, job descriptions, right? Uh, that we actually write words and wording that is one that really speaks to the different lived experiences of people in our community. So for example, sometimes very often actually, we see bachelor's degrees, right? Or things of that sort. Uh, and that would basically shy away anyone who couldn't or couldn't afford or couldn't finish a bachelor's degree or didn't want to go there, right? Or whatever the reason may be. So uh, really valuing lived experience as something that is truly powerful. And it comes with a, not only a history of resilience, but so many other skills that are coming from people who are in, a, in different diverse communities. Uh, and also I wanted, you know, I always, uh, it's, it's a little weird for me to talk about only about LGBTQ issues, right? Because I'm also an immigrant. Uh, and uh, guess, guess what? The LGBTQ people are in every community. Uh, and this is the reason why we keep talking about this important factor, right? That our lives are not just sectioned off in silos. Uh, even the fact that we're having this discussion the way we are is so fruitful, right? Uh, but truly understanding that when you are bringing someone into the fold, uh, let them be their whole self. Uh, don't ask them to put one head out, one foot out, one foot in, 
uh, give them a real voice. Uh, think about the structure of your organization. So if you have a board of directors, how many people of different communities you serve are there? Uh, that's one question. What are the requirements do you have to serve on your board? Do people have to raise a certain amount of money? Uh, is that equitable? Does that allow for everyone to have a seat at the table and a voice, right? Because if you are on a board and you feel disempowered, then you're not going to speak and you're not going to bring about the change that you could have if you if you truly had a, a, a true place there, right? Uh, because that's what I all uh, what I have seen uh, as failed experiments of diversity, right? People look around, they're like, "Well, we're missing a black person here," so, so they call their black friend. <laughs> Come to this meeting, <laughs> can you please? And then you know, uh, instead of thinking about, okay, what is the what does the black community need? Who are the people working in those fields? How can I ask them to come? How can I actually collaborate with them so we can co-create together? All of these different factors, right? Uh, so I'll just mention those uh, those three points. No, I like, like you said, it's it's and that talks talks back to the the, the idea of like not being tokenism. It's not just well, let's get this BIPOC person. That let's not get this just this LGBTQ member. Let's not just get somebody who might have some sort of disability just so that we can have them here. They, we need to allow them to be a part of this. Uh, I, Heather, do you have something? And I know Stacey, you said, I saw your hand. Um, well, I mean, I do have a, a few points that I'll have to say, but about the the board members and the tokenism, you know, I think it's important that we that we listen to the community, but also take a look at ourselves and what we need. Like, what what is it that we're missing? You know, we know that we're missing in certain areas when it comes to all of these issues, right? All of the marginalized communities. But really, what is it that your organization is trying to do? So looking at your goals rather than just the placeholders, um, because we want to be intentional about it. You don't just want to have, OK, there's the there's the LGBT person who's now on our board. You know, let's let's just check that box. So so what is the intention of it? What does your board actually need? What does the organization need? Right. Um, because I'm actually going through that in our own organization right now. But then another thing that occurred to me, and I think it was Megan who said who talked a little bit about casting. Casting keeps coming up. You know, when you're talking through trans and non-binary inclusion, we're not just trying to put a trans person in a trans role. Right. We want to make sure that it's not about just that issue. It's not it's not just putting a trans person to amplify a trans voice or a non-binary person. It's also to have equitable casting across the board, just like what you're saying with people of color. You know, it's not about that one token character. It's about being able to have a trans person in a non-trans role. Um, and I think that that's very important and, and it, it's not um, widely presented like it needs to be on the scale. I mean, we're starting to see a little bit of change in that. Um, and then we mentioned also about marketing, you know, um, when we're marketing same same gender couples and families, you know, we also exist in families. Um, and so making sure that that's highlighted. Thank you. Uh, Stacia. Okay, let me know if I'm feeding back again. So. Um, the uh, I think one of the things too about the channels is is twofold. Number one, it's like it's up to the the individual, the organization, to look at the channels and how they're reaching people. It's like if you're just putting something out and in the same way you've always put an announcement out, whether that's you know an, an audition announcement or whatever, the people who are not who already don't feel welcomed in that community or who already are not naturally a part into that community are not going to see that message. Mm -hmm. So it's incumbent upon the organization and the organizations to develop relationships with the specific um, uh, or uh, advocacy organizations. That's where folks are. Um, and especially then when you're starting to, to, to reach out to them, make sure there's something there for them when they reach back. Because one of the things that we find is, is really challenging, and we do a lot of work with uh, foreign languages, and we'll have a, a situation where it's like, you know, we've put together an entire program in three or four different, uh, in, in a language, a language, that gets broadcast out, hey, we're multi-language. And it's like, okay, how many languages were in this community? Did you serve the Somali community and the Hmong community and the Hispanic community? And so they, a lot of things went up there and then people came out and there was nothing there. Um, 
I think that's always an important thing is to look at those, those types of channels. The other one, though, I think is, is much more personal. Um, when we first started working with the blind community, it was a it was a, and quite frankly, it was a business opportunity that that just kind of fell into our laps. A client called us up and said, hey, we need this thing. Can you do it? Well, there's only one answer. Yes, of course. Um, mm -hmm. As we went on, though, and I discovered that, you know, I, I had mentors, I had classes that I took uh, working with blind people within the community, but those were these transactional student teacher relationships. And I started realizing that I didn't have any friends in the blind community. I knew people who had who were blind. I knew people who spoke other language. And I, I mean, I had friends from like multi multi ethnic friends, shall we say, and not one or two here and there. It's just, you know, I live in Orlando. Come on. Um, but I didn't have any blind friends. And so I intentionally set out to go make some friends. And as in, this was in my forties. And so I had to go to parties and I had to go to bars and I went into the, to the conferences and I went to these different places looking for people that I just liked. And it took years, but I actually made friends. And I think this goes back to what I kind of counsel everyone to do in, in our client relationships. I'm like, honestly, look around your organization and ask yourself and ask anybody, do you have any really friends, not family members, because you kind of stuck with them, but friends that you have developed a, a real relationship with that when you go out to dinner, you're not going out to pick their brain about blindness. You're going out to dinner because you want to hang out and, you know, shoot the shit kind of deal. Yeah. That's a whole different relationship and a whole different understanding of needs and experience. I think that goes back to the, the what everyone's kind of been saying about it. it's like normalizing. It's it's and, and it, we have to take it upon ourselves, not just in our professional, but in our personal lives. Like you said, that it's we're not saying that we just need to do this just for work, but this is we need this in our life. Yes, we need it in the organization, but what do we need in our lives? And it's just normalizing. Everyone is, you know, everyone is should be on that same should be on that same playing field. I know that that's not happening, but that's what it should be. And not only in the professional, but in the personal. Um, and before we move on, I just want to check in, Megan, did you have anything you wanted to add about um, the subject of tokenism and how to kind of fight that and how do we move past that and, and to really include everyone? Um, sure, well, I appreciated um, Tosh's question about whether or not there was a casting agency that was specific to disabled actors as well as being in Florida. And to my knowledge, there is not one that is based in Florida. Um, if anyone knows differently, please let me know. I would love to talk with them. Um, but there are several different people um, working throughout the world that are um, building um, just these like great resources for, um, for models as well as for actors that are disabled. Um, but again, not anything locally that I'm aware of. And I think I saw that in the chat too, that, that they were saying that they, they, they didn't think locally there is one that they, they might have somebody who is disabled in their, their ranks, but it's not specifically, thank you. Yeah, Beth Marshall made that comment. There's not one that just specifically focuses on that. Um, so that, that kind of makes me want to go to this next section, which we talked and, and Trish brought up about casting. Um, and how do we, uh, on all of these fronts, and it kind of connects with marketing too, because marketing's casting, somebody had to make the decision to put those people up there. How do we create, um, or how do we go in into these agencies or in uh, to these casting directors, and how do we make sure that there is something in place that checks and balances that they're not just saying, well, we saw, well, we saw 10 black people today and we saw somebody who was in a wheelchair today or, and, and that's good, we did that and that's all that matters. But then when you see the final product, it's just the same thing you've seen for the past umpteen years. What, um, and this is, again, this is a, a free fall to skate. If you have it, just you know, raise your hand and we'll go. But how do you feel like, what can we do? What, is, what do we need to do in the community to make sure that checks and balances in there for casting? Uh, Megan. So I think that there's um, a couple different ways you can approach this. Um, one of the ways that I think we can do this is by supporting each other and for speaking up for each other when we notice that things are not the way that they could be. Um, and that means reaching out of our areas and lifting other voices um, that may not be our niche, which also helps break down those walls of tokenism. Um, another way of doing this is making sure that organizations from the board to the staff, to the volunteers, 
to all of the different advisory panels that everybody is involved and is represented. Anyone else? Uh, Makai. So uh, I think it's very important to also make sure that the groundwork is being laid to be able to welcome people from different walks of life because, you know, there, there seems to be this underlying bias, especially since a lot of people have this fondness for the golden age musicals and things like that that this is what I expect uh, the cast of Guys and Dolls to look like. This is what I ex expect the cast of Rogers and Hammerstein's yada yada to look like. And I think moving on from these historically biased shows to include more artists of different backgrounds would also be a good thing to get the foot in the door to allow more people to feel like they're welcome in the audition room and i also believe that having a push to be able to compensate actors more would be a very helpful thing because i i'm a firm believer that if anybody on the staff is getting paid then you definitely need to pay your actors as well and your tax at least something and uh to put a bow on that definitely opening the space to make you feel welcome because frankly i used to be an actor full-time and i was not getting cast in most things because of my type and that was the feedback that i was getting which pushed me to be a writer and director which at the end of the day i am thankful for however it shouldn't have to be a case of well in order for me and my friends who I know are going through the same thing to be seen and heard, I would have to create the space ourselves. And I mean, as much as there is value and merit to that, that should not have to be the only way that we get seen. You should have the ability to do both. If you to choose which way you'd like to go, you shouldn't be forced into exactly. that pathway of like, I have to create everything myself because I'm not being welcomed here. Right. Stacia? Yeah, if I could add something to that, which uh, uh, again, you know, maybe, one of the most meaningful things that I ever heard when I, in my quest on this journey, I was at a conference and it was an arts and disability conference and the keynote speaker um, stood up in front of this, this crowd of people. And it was incredibly diverse or something. And she said the most profound words that were just so incredibly obvious that it just took me a moment to, to really hear them, which is that self-advocacy is exhausting. And for people who are, again, people like me, I don't have to self-advocate very often. Right. So I keep thinking I was, and, and that moment really changed my focus. And so as people who don't have to live a life of self-advocacy to just every once in a while say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to pick up this bag and I'm going to run with it today. I'm going to be if I see something where I can help, I can be beneficial, I can point something out. I can do that for someone. Um, but and again, not as a way to turn the, the spotlight on on, you know, what we're doing, but as a way to say, you know what? This is a, a situation where as a, a an ally, as a consultant, as the person who can who has the um, the connections and the 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 the, the life, the whatever that I ha that that the inter the, the what do we call it? The, the infrastructure. The um, network, yeah. Yeah. If I can make a if I can make a difference, I should I it's not that I could it's that I should. Because it's it's. That that bit of understanding, I swear to you, it changed my work and it changed my life because it made such a connection to me to see something so obvious that it, it just didn't occur to me. How silly! So and and that's what what to, to kind of pull it back to this the specific our their casting you know our, our casting calls and our, our the directors and how do we make sure that in those in those rooms that we're really making sure that we're making it open and we're keeping it. Uh, in check to to connect with what you just said for me it sounds like we need to make sure that there are those allies that we know are in those casting places that are going to be like hey guys listen yeah you're saying this but we're not doing it right so we need to we need to fix these things we need to make these changes makai sorry yes i have a question for the group real quick if anybody happens to know and this is something that i struggle with a little bit when i graduated college and i was thinking okay so I, as a black man, am, I want to be a director professionally. So 
it's not as cut and dry as you know casting or auditions or things like that to be able to say here's what we're looking for and here's how we do it and i'm not quite sure how people artists of all different backgrounds will be able to even break the mold of getting into the scene at first because yes everybody talks about having uh diverse casting agents and directors and producers and things like that but how does one without necessarily having to you know uh buy a venue or some or rent a venue or something like that how does one get into the room because it doesn't seem like there are any um there are any job notices of we're hiring a director for this and that or we're, we need producers for this so it seems like to be word of mouth or more appointed position and please correct me if i'm wrong but that seems to be the case for the most part are, are you do you mean in sense of like how do you how do you just get into the room and right, that, and because like how how does a young black director want to get into the room and, or into any room without creating that room for themselves? Because as Stacia was saying, self advocacy is very tiring. <laughs> and how does one, you know, come into this pre established community that is very tight knit, but expanding it to people who did not have a voice in it before? Does anybody have uh, like anything? That, like, yeah. Um, I just want to say that's one of the things that we're really, really focusing on with CFEA is encouraging people to widen their circles, meaning that you're not just looking to the people that you would normally look to when these positions become available and also creating positions. So whereas you may already have an artistic director and that person's going to be there for the next 10 years, create a position where you have a co-director or an associate or an assistant or something um, where you can have someone of color there um, alongside you and a part of the decision-making processes as well. Um, I think that's super important. We have to look at it from a positive standpoint, though, of widening the circle and not like, oh, I'm handing out opportunities. No, you're you're increasing your value because you're widening widening the space that you um, that you have and the opportunities and the people that you connect with. So you're adding value to not just your content but to your organization. Stasia. And Felipe, yeah. Uh, one thing, and I think this is absolutely critical, is uh, going back to the organizations, to anyone that is in a, a, a leadership position, an influencer position, and that's to incentivize leadership. So as like you said, you know, what are the what are the responsibilities of being a board member, a staff member here? You have that yearly review coming up as a, a, a board. You can make one of your review po components. How many new people have you brought in? Tell me about them. How many opportunities did you create? Tell me about them. And going by that, that the, the question, you know, about the, the exhausting self-advocacy, anytime those opportunities come up and mention it to somebody, you know, it's like when you have the opportunity to talk to anyone, a member of any board, anywhere is, and nobody says, I want you to do this. It's like, you know, tell me about what you have. Tell me about your, your, your expanded mentorship program. Tell me about it, you know, cause if they don't have it, and this is, this is actually probably one of the most effective things that, that we ask our um, uh, advocates in the blind community to do is I don't ask them to go say, it's like, you need to have this for me. Tell me about what you tell me about. Okay. I want to go to the, to go to your museum. Tell me about what you have. Tell me about your, your description programs. Tell me about this as a, so then they have the opportunity and then they have to come to their own realization of what they're, what, the empty spaces. Um, I think that I do think though that this really is a problem of people in leadership positions. Though you cannot advocate your way to the table, you cannot elbow your way in. It's very hard to do. That is an insurmountable ask sometimes. So for people who are on this call or other calls. Um, Make it on your priority checklist when you sit down and decide whether you're going to be on a board or you're going to be work for a community or if you're sitting at a, a conference and you happen to be at the table with like five or six people, bring it up, ask them. And um, that's part of that idea of just making it a habit of how you, you function in the arts. Felipe? I, I think that we have to understand, in my opinion, there are three levels, right? So one is there is a structural issue here. The structural issue is that we live in a culture that of, uh, of where one group dominates all the other groups. <laughs> and because of that, those are the stories that are told. 
So there aren't many stories of diverse experiences, right? So I, I am madly in love with my husband, for example, and seldomly you will see a same sex couple being happy together, you know, like just living their lives in any movie. When you see an LGBTQ story, it's usually really sad. It's usually about heartbreak. It's like your life is never going to be great. You're always going to be sad and, you know, people are going to come after you. You know, and some of that is not, you know, there is a lot of challenges in being an LGBTQ person, but you can be happy too and live a happy life. And there isn't a lot of those stories being told because what we see is, People who look at us, and that's what they see, they don't, they, it's not coming from our own perspective, right? It's not a story being told by us. Um, so I think that's one. And then the second is, I think several people talked about advocating, at, but I believe in advocating as an organization. So a good example of this is what Fringe is doing right now, right? <laughs> you, you're you hosting this panel, we're all talking about this topic, but I am sure you're influencing the arts community in Central Florida, and in many ways, pushing them in the right direction, it's a good thing, right? We should push ourselves to be better than what we are, not set, it's not set up just for the whatever standards we have in, in our society. And third, I do believe that uh, as individuals with access, uh, including myself, you know, like, uh, or anyone in the school, or anyone who has any kind of access, we need to advocate for people to actually get real opportunities. <laughs> when you you have a personal responsibility, when you see a casting agent uh, only casting white folks to say something about that, it's your responsibility uh, and it's our collective responsibilities as, as individual leaders. And I think that uh, I I forgot her name. Her name I think her first name is Beth Beth Marshall. And she yeah, wrote mentorship right as a comment. Uh, absolutely, you know. We need to mentor each other. I think about a lot about what, once upon a time, I was a very disempowered gay immigrant growing up in Miami. That was my life. Uh, and someone saw something in me and mentored me and really took me from a horrible situation and gave me opportunities that I would never have. I would not be here if it wasn't for the very first person that opened that first door for me. And, uh, it is my responsibility to do the, the same thing for others, for the other Felipe's in the world, but it is also our collective responsibility to do that too. One, to mentor them so they have the skills to actually uh, be able to really, um, I guess, enjoy the benefits of opportunities, but also advocate for opportunities to really exist in the first place. And I, I want to touch on the two points of what you just said. It, I, I find it very interesting because I know I feel that way myself as a gay man. It's like, why does every story about a homosexual have to be sad and how they, you know, it's again, I think it's that, it's that normalizing. It's my biggest pet peeve of all pet peeves. <laughs> I, I, I watch Netflix specifically looking for stories like this because every time I look at it, I'm like, okay, none of these people represent me. Uh, and these are the only LGBTQ stories that are being told, which to me tells that we are not getting a chance to share our own perspective. Uh, it's, it, it's, a story being, it's a story about us, but not for us, if that being makes sense. Being told by somebody else. Exactly. And I think, other, I think a lot of the other communities would probably agree with that about feelings. Like why does, just because I am unique, you know, I am part of the BIPOC, I'm part of the accessibility community, disability community, I'm part of the LGBTQ, that doesn't mean my story has to be of strife and just, it's a, it goes back to just normalizing. We are normal people. Like Mika said, like it was, we buy soda, we go these places. And that it, it's, that's what it is. It's, we are like, I like that. We are normal people. Thank you, Mika, we are. And, um, and what I'm getting from the group here is saying it's like this is a it's a it's a top down situation. We can't just say, well, how do we fix the casting? It do we have to go to the boards and we have to make sure that these people on the boards are taking these mentorships and they are questioning themselves and they are questioning the people around them and saying, what are we do? What are we doing? What are we actually doing? And let us bring us people. Let us bring in people. Let's create those spaces at the table. Let us create these positions that allow people who don't look like us who are, you know, but they need to be here. And, and, and that's the thing, like you said, Felipe, somebody lending, a, offering a hand and being like, here you are, here is your space. Because it is, it, like Stacey was saying, it's like that self-advocacy. You can't, 
it's very difficult to nudge your way in if that that knit is not going to open up. So somebody in that knit has to go, no, we're opening up. You know, the first time that I felt truly empowered was when this very first person, a mentor of mine, uh, she we were in we were in an event and then she came. She just walked right at me and she said, what do you think? <laughs> uh, and honestly, that was the first time that somebody had asked me that. Uh, and my mind was completely blown, right? I was like this young kid, <laughs> uh, well, well, the kind of person that Heather and I were talking in the beginning of this conversation, right? This young LGBTQ immigrant, just trying to figure my way out in the world. And she asked me, what were my thoughts on my own life? <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was groundbreaking for me. Yeah, it's and I think that's something that somebody else mentioned before. It's not like look at what we created for you. What do you need? What do you need us to create for you? What do you need? Um, what kind think, of? Coming, I'm sorry, BK. Yes, I was going to say um, I wrote this in the chat, but I think it's so very important to acknowledge that we are coming here and we are having these kinds of conversations, and we are broadening and we are widening, and that is so amazing. But a lot of people who are the decision makers are not doing what we're doing right now. They're not putting in this kind of work. And so we have to acknowledge that, that when we're talking about change comes from the head, from the head down, the head is not really, you know, involved in these kinds of circles. And so we have to put pressure on them to start to be involved in this kind of thing, to start to be in these conversations and, um, make that change reflective in their environments because if they don't they're going to remain unaware and we're going to see little change i mean we will be growing and we will be expanding but we will continue to see the cyclical effects of them not changing so you know that's why when it comes to cfea we're so um we're targeting leadership because we know that they are really the ones that that need the most change. So we're we're putting the pressure on them to change their mentalities, to widen their circles, to do all of these things that we are saying here that you know we've already had the epiphanies, we are, we've already had the understanding, but we've got to get them to see otherwise we won't see the change that we want to see. And I as uh, I was gonna say I saw Stacia um and Beth Marshall, white, rich board members need to fis fiscally sponsor, sponsor whatever it is needed to have the equity and representation at the table if the money is a thing. And that, yeah, that is the thing. It's, I think what we were talking about the, from the head down or, and like Stacia was saying, it's like, and, and Felipe mentioned his story, like if those people are there, first of all, if they're not doing anything, call them out. Like somebody just said, say, you know, why are you not, you know, make, you have to make a choice now and, 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 you know, you can be polite about it as possible, but it's like, at the end of the day, we need an answer. You need to tell us where you stand on this. Um, and then if you have those uh, resources, you have to start sharing those. Stacia? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and this is actually one of the, the, the things that I always, I, I, I work really hard to counsel people to, to work on. Because first of all, as, as an advocate, advocates don't have to be nice. They don't have to be polite. You can, you can bang on doors, you can demand. I mean, this is an important aspect of advocacy. You don't have to ask anybody's permission to advocate. Um, but one of the things that becomes very, is, is being, well, once you do get in that room and you get in, the, in the, that, that moment and you have your moment, you know, choosing the way to, to get, to elicit the response you want. One of the most powerful phrases that we use whenever we're dealing with, when I'm trying to get, you know, uh, one of a client and it's usually like, a, it's either a board member or a director or a, something to, to do something. I never ask them why they are or are not doing anything because they're going to explain to me why I'm wrong. The word why is always going to come back to, here's why you're wrong, Stacia. Here's why we don't need to do, here's all the wonderful things we've been doing. Why isn't that good enough for you? Um, it's always, how do we do that? Or what are you doing? Or what are we doing? Um, something that elicits an actual answer. It's not about being, you know, hat in hand, hand holding, but using the, the, the language and the words that's going to get you the result you want. And that result for, for me, again, for what I'm trying to do is I need that person to let go of some purse strings to do what we need to do so we can get this thing moving forward and they can see the world a little bit more the way I see it. Um, and again, for me, because in that case, it is a, a, a transactional 
experience and they're paying me money. So normally they listen more when they're paying you. Um, the important thing for me is like, it is no skin off my nose to sit there and say, wow, yeah, let's, that's wonderful what you're doing. And, and, and how, can, how can we do better? I will absolutely do that every single time. And again, going back to the idea of being an advocate and a consultant and a leader, when you are that person and you just make it a, a habit of your being, for those of you who are the, the, the folks who are listening, make it a habit of your being to say, how can we do better? What are we doing today? How can we do better? And and, and that's something that we definitely said at, at the beginning and that Fringe is, is feeling is that this is, this is a process. This is a journey. This is not a thing. So it's like once you've hit that, you've hit this one point. All right. Now, how do we improve upon this? And how do we keep moving that mark forward for, for everybody? Uh, Makai? I just really want to quickly say, you know, money talks the loudest. And I think it's important to really hold these people accountable to say that I understand that you've been listening. I understand that you've been watching these things. And we've been having this conversation specifically for, oh, I don't know, five, six months now. And when theater comes back post-pandemic, we need to make sure that everybody you know, puts up or shuts up because quite frankly, if I see one more production of In the Heights, that's an all white cast. And I think that nobody's really listening. No, it's under, it is, it's that, it's that accountability. It's how do we make sure that the people um, are listening and how, and how do we get to those right people to open those doors for everyone? Um, we're about, uh, we're about nine minutes out till, till our stream is done. So what I want to do is I want to open it up to um, everyone to give any sort of final comments they'd like to say about anything that was said today or maybe wasn't even said today. Um, so if anybody would like to start first, uh, just give me a hand and I will go from there. But again, if you want to comment on something that was said today or if you feel like there wasn't something mentioned. And again, I want to remind everyone who's watching and everyone who's here, we our plan here at Fringe is to continue these conversations so that we had this one, we've started talking, but it's like now we're going to break away and how do we get in deeper with each of these groups um, and even connecting the groups, like Felipe said, there's there's cross sectionality. There's it's so hard because I think we live in a world where we put everyone in boxes. It's a lot easier to put everyone in boxes because that's what our brain can handle. But we have to realize we're all different. We're all we all have these different aspects and and things that make who up who we are. So we can't just start cutting people into bits to try to figure out who they are. Um, so does anybody whoever wants to start, if you have any final comments, and um, we've got about eight or so minutes. I know it's like everyone. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll go ahead and say. Echo A. Whatever. I mean, I'll go ahead and say. Don't be afraid to have the conversations, that need to be had with. You see it. For those who are watching, and you see somebody, that kid's got a spark. Let me help spark that. Let me put the hand out. Let me. Uh, as you know, open the door for somebody that's not really expecting it to help open that window in their mind that they never even imagine. You know, what do you think about life? Like Felipe said, what do you think about life? And you're like, uh, me? Wow, I never even thought someone cared. And to offer that moment of that we care about our next generations. Our, our our people, our our folks that are getting left out. Just if you get a spark, go with it. Talk to the person. Let them know how can I help. How can I reach out? What do you need? Like this, like we were saying, what do you need to facilitate this dream or this question? Uh, and don't be afraid to have the conversations. We have to have these conversations throughout our nation. And so. Start in your community. Start yeah. in your church. Your 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 place of gathering. Start small, and um, and think big. Uh, that's all I. Got. <laughs> I like it. No, thank you. <laughs> it's true, Trish. Like you said, it's like have those conversations and be willing to to make the mistakes. I think so many people are afraid just to open their mouths and say something wrong, so then they get afraid and then they step back. Yeah, no um, one tiptoeing. We can't tiptoe anymore. We've we've tiptoed around a lot of things for long enough. For long enough, and. Yeah. You, 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 there's solid ground there. Go ahead, step in. Yeah. Get you wet. And I'd, and I'd rather have to step in and help you and correct you than hear yeah. nothing at all. Then hear nothing at all. I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, so my little closing remarks, I'm just going to say that um, it is 100% true that none of us here walking now 
created this problem, but we all inherited it. So, you know, we cannot continue to make excuses or give that excuse of like, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't start this, you know, it's not my problem. I don't think like that. You may not think like that, but everything that we operate in was built by people who thought like that. So we have to be so very, very intentional about dismantling it and establishing something new that does not reflect those ideals. So, you know, I don't think it's overnight. I don't think, I think it's something that we're still going to be having conversations about five years from now. You know, but I think that, you know, the the more intentional we are and the more we press and the more we make it uncomfortable to continue to operate in those traditions, the better off we will be. So we didn't create it, but we inherited it. And so we've got to work together to fix it. I love that. I love you said dismantle it. You got it. It may not have been the thing created, but it's our thing to our obstacle. It's our problem to fix now. We got to We have to step up. And if we don't think like that, that's great. Then let's put the places in the way that we do think that are more open and more more normalizing. Uh, Felipe. Well, I I love everything that's been said so far. And honestly, I want to thank everyone for, (laughs) I feel so honored. I've learned so much from each and every single one of you. Thank you. Uh, I think that this is, we need to have a commitment to uh, really strong, uh, strong commitment to structural change. Uh, deep change, uh, really change the root causes of this issue, right? Uh, And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of us talked about this a little bit, about the importance of having decision-making power, the importance of having voices that are not just there because we were trying to have a quota, but because we truly care about that person and the perspective that they bring to the table. And then finally, I always think about social change as sort of like climbing a mountain, because uh, climbing a mountain is extremely difficult. And the higher you go, the closer to the peak, the harder it gets. So uh, all of these conversations and the uncomfortable conversations that we're having with each other, quote unquote, uh, really is, it, it's because we are, getting, we are getting higher and higher. And the higher you go, the further you see in the horizon. So you see more than before. So I just wanted to end with do not settle. Do not settle with the current standard. Uh, think about what the kind of world that we should be living in and work towards that. I love it. Makai. I just want to quickly mention the famous quote from People of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. And you'd be surprised how easy it is for people to walk through the door if you just open it, even a little bit. I would like to the my my final phrase is more like on the the practicalities of things. If you're an arts organization, uh, if you have any type of leadership at whatever level, uh, leadership position, either board, uh, leadership director level, anything like that, arts organizations need two things. They need an audit and they need a plan. And number one, it's like if you've never done an accessibility audit or an inclusivity audit or something like that, go online. Google that, you can download a form and you can actually audit yourself basically and and see the things that you might be missing. There are tons of them out there. There are very special arts, the National Park Service, the United Arts, they they exist and you can get them. The second one is then to come up with a plan and at each little area that you uncovered in that audit, write down, I can do this now for no money. I can do this next year for a little money. I can do this five years now from now with some fundraising and a lot of money and have those two documents in your desk, on the wall, hand it out, talk out at every meeting, something so that you're not letting it fall apart or fall through the cracks. An audit and a plan. Very nice. Megan and Heather, do you have anything you'd like to add on before? There have been so many great things said, but the thing that keeps coming to my mind in closing will be that, you know, we have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. This is not easy. And this assessment and microscope and everything that we're doing, not easy work, right? And so we have to be okay with that. Um, It's not only about intentionality, but it's also about feeling vulnerable and being vulnerable and feeling uncomfortable in those moments to have these conversations. And I just want to thank you all for being here and um, for the Fringe for actually having the conversations. And I know that this doesn't stop here, but this is what it takes. Thank you, Heather. Megan? 
hate going last. You guys are all brilliant. <laughs> and I love everything well. that you have said and contributed. Um, but I did want to just remind everyone again that this is uncomfortable and sometimes just being seen is uncomfortable. But when someone does have the strength to contribute and to share their experience, please believe them. Um, please hold that and take that seriously because um, they are coming from a place of vulnerability into your place of vulnerability. And so please honor that and we'll all grow stronger together. Thank you Megan, again. That was, Megan, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. I do want to thank this amazing panel. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I was like, this is gorgeous and I wanna, I'm just crying on the inside. Um, it's great to see the groups because that's what it is. The groups have to come together. We have to, anybody who's ever felt marginalized and left behind, it can't be, well, I'm fighting for this and you're gonna be fighting for that. It's, we are all fighting for the same thing and it's that seat at the table. It's being recognized as normal. We are just like everybody else. Um, so thank you all my wonderful panel, this wonderful panel for joining, amazing things. Um, we want to thank you all who joined us today. Uh, keep an eye out for the remainder of these sessions because um, we're gonna do breakaways and we wanna talk and like we said, it's a process. It's gonna be uncomfortable, but if we want you to join us on this journey because not only do we wanna change the arts community, we wanna change our community as a whole. It's not just about the arts, it's, every, it's how you view the world all around you. So thank you so much. Keep an eye out for us also First Fringe Fridays. Uh, the IDA committee is also making sure that those um, the programming for our First Fringe is reaching out to different groups. We already had one for transgender and non-binary, uh, non-conforming gender artists. Um, we had our BIPOC community um, join us on one and we wanna keep pushing that. We wanna make sure that everyone has their voice shown. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, my wonderful panel. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful night.